How's everybody doing today? Good? Awesome. It's good to see you guys. If we've never met, my name is Eric. I'm the uh, director of ministry here at Rockfish. Uh, so it's good to see some new faces in here. Um, we are, we're starting out a new series this month, guys. It's, it's called A Grateful Heart. Um, we, try, we try and be really intentional with uh, the month of November. I'm really taking a second, take a breath, take a knee, and really reflect on all that God is doing and has done for us uh, and is continuing to do, right? So uh, th- this month, as we talk about a grateful heart, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look a little different. We'll have, um, it'll be kind of video-led. We're going we're gonna to share testimonies, and I'm going to encourage you guys at the end to share your testimonies at some point as well. But the whole point here is that, that, we, would, that we would take a second and just remember all the things that, one, we take for granted and we're just so busy in our lives that we don't even really have, we don't, we don't have, we don't intentionally take enough time, more than likely for most of us, to set aside time and just reflect on what he's doing, what he's done, and how grateful we ought to be, the things we take for granted on a regular basis. And so we just want to help coach everybody through, hey, let's, let's spend this month in reflection. Let's, let's do all we can to pursue having a grateful heart and then hopefully we you know we achieve that and continually for lack of better terms you know increase in in that capability and so one of the ways we can do that is is in exercising humility right recognizing the things that we had no part in and if we did have a role it was minimal he set all the things in place he put all the relationships in place for us to be successful and, and to receive gifts and to receive blessings and, and to live a life that's lavish compared to most, even, even if we might be struggling in a moment or a season for the, compared to the rest of the world, we're doing pretty good here. And so it's this intentional looking back at, at all the little things and the big things he's done for us. And so wor- worship is, is one of these ways that we're able to express his, our appreciation and adoration of him. So it's, it's should have been on my heart much sooner, but regularly it's been on my heart as we as we are about to begin worship, and even as we're closing out of worship, that that I'm asking God to to open our hearts, to set our minds on Him, that we would not be distracted, that we would be able to worship Him in a way that is truly pleasing and a blessing to Him, something that that He would look down on and smile, that His that His children. Those that claim him as a father would, would truly receive and understand his love for them. So again, worship is one of the ways we can do this, right? So as, as we worship this month, and especially in December, as we, as we look at you know, Christ, the, the anniversary, the celebration of Christ being sent, to his people, to save his people, to live with his people, and to love them, and to show us how to live, as we as we spend the next few weeks in the in this season of celebration and, and thankfulness, continually examine what it is we have to be grateful for. But this week we're going to talk about provoking people. One of these things we're we're called to do as disciples of Christ is we're actually we're we're called to provoke people. So. A lot of times we'll, we'll get provoked into the wrong situation, right, or the wrong reaction, or we're the ones doing the provoking of somebody else into a, uh, maybe an action that, that uh, we, we might be embarrassed about or they might be embarrassed about the way everything went down uh, afterwards. But this, this command to us, right, is, is in Hebrews 10, 24, and it says, let's consider how to provoke one another, not, not just to anything, right, but one another to love and good works. And so we, we sat around in our little Saturday morning discipleship group uh, speaking about this. Am I struggling? It's, it's good. Okay. okay. Easy enough. All right. Is that better? Yeah. Awesome. Sorry about that. All right. So we sat around last Saturday discussing, okay, what is it we can do or that we should do to be successful in this provoking others to love and good works? 
Because sitting up here and just preaching about it only does so much, right? Oh, sitting at home and reading our Bible only does so much. So what is it everybody within the body can do for somebody else within the body to provoke them to good works and to love? And so we came up with two primary ways to do this, and the first one is, is modeling, right? So anybody, and, and so we, we use this term leader as somebody who's like above other people, but the, the reality is within this body, we are all called to be leaders within the community, within the greater body which we live in, right? So we are, as we are attempting to lead people to Christ, we're in this leadership role. It's been assigned to us. We don't have, a, we, we don't have the ability to unassign ourselves from that responsibility. So one of the things we do from leading within is we model. So I shouldn't be asking anybody within the body or outside the body to do something in love or, or that would exemplify good works if I'm not willing to do it on my own. And if you haven't probably seen me do some version of that before, same goes for everybody else in this room, right? So as, as we're raising up our children, as we're working with our coworkers, and we're saying, this is how you do it, ensure that that's how you've been doing it as well. And if you haven't been, get in alignment with what God has commanded us to do before you're bothering to tell somebody else to do it. But that doesn't mean don't tell anybody because you're not willing to do it. That just means get in line so you can do that as well. It is not about berating other people, right? But it's we're told to provoke others. We want to inspire. We want to motivate. We want to extract and cultivate that within. Each person is going to go love people and do good works. So we do this by modeling, right? That's, that's one of the things that I would demonstrate on a daily basis exactly what to do. And if I'm doing it well enough and I'm seeing success in it, then I shouldn't even have to tell you anything. You ought to be like, man, that look, kind of looks fun, right? That looks exciting. That looks successful. I want to be a part of that. So when we model it well, we may not have to say anything at all. It may already draw people in. But the other is, the other is sharing, right? So if I'm up here preaching or, or Pastor Tony or Patrick's up here preaching saying, this is what you should go do, and you never see us do it, and then you never hear about the fruit that comes within that ministry, whatever version the ministry is, if you never hear about the fruit, then why, why would you know that it's harvest time? Why would you know that, that where we are going to reach people or who we're sharing with is producing fruit, that the soil is, is ripe for planting, and that all we need to do is show up and we need to water and we need to cultivate, we need to dig around that root and, and in a couple months, in a couple of years, whoever it is, we're going to be able to harvest. We're going to be a part of that, and we get to celebrate that. So it's the sharing. And so when I say sharing, a lot of times we'll say, share your testimony, right? And that's powerful. That's important. But specifically in this situation, that you would share victories in ministry with other people, not just your story, but the story you've witnessed with other folks, right? So we know, we know Pablo's not here because we haven't heard preach three times, right? So, but Pablo is out, he's in the field, the dude is evangelical like nobody's business, right? And he comes back from the field and he says, guys, I didn't just go do a homeless ministry, I met this guy named Steve and I know his story and I know how he got there and I know what he needs on the way out and I know what brings him hope and as I shared it with him, I saw it hit him and I saw something change in his heart and he's ready to give his life to Christ. That's fruit. But if we keep that fruit to ourselves and we don't share that fruit with others, then we don't spread the ability, the desire to go out into the field and reap the harvest with them, to, to water that seed with them, whatever it may be. That could be in guest services. That could be in the tech booth, whatever it is. It doesn't matter what the ministry or the outreach mechanism is. You have to be willing to share testimony of what you've seen. Now, we do this carefully, right? There's, there's the wrong, right and wrong way to do that because you could do that in a way that it just exposes the mess out of somebody's life and, and make them a whole lot more vulnerable. And, and now, now they can't even walk into the church without everybody knowing their story that they weren't willing to tell yet. So we do this cautiously. We do this wisely, okay? But there are stories out there, stories of victory, of, of reaching the lost and seeing the change of reaching the broken and seeing the healing. We had a, we had a gentleman get baptized last night uh, during Saturday night service. 
they met, they met him in the homeless ministry about 13 months ago and prayed with him that he would receive Christ. And there he was last night getting baptized, going out of his way to come all the way from Fayetteville, probably having to get a ride from somebody given, given his living condition and given his life and publicly proclaiming Christ as his Lord and Savior. Right? Sharing the fruit. And it had nothing to do with somebody else taking credit for it, but somebody else gets to share it with somebody else who hasn't experienced it yet. There's a power that comes with sharing our testimony and the testimony we've witnessed. And I want to encourage you, be willing, be courageous enough and wise enough to share that appropriately with the right people at the right time. Psalm 9 1 through 2. It says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. We got to give cr- the credit to God in all these moments the little ones and the big ones. The I saw somebody freed from the chains of some kind of addiction. I saw somebody freed from the chains of an unhealthy relationship. I saw somebody tithe in faith or give an offering in faith when it was their last two pennies. And yet, they stumbled into money that was never going to come their way unless they moved in faith. Whatever it may be. I'm not trying to talk you guys into throwing more in the bucket. There's, there's fruit in so many different ways when we live out this ministry right. But we got to share it. There's these times when it, it seems like, well, this person receives good fortune and it's just always coincidence. Like it always just happens to work out for them. How much longer are we willing to just call everything a coincidence or good chance or good fortune without acknowledging where that fortune comes from? We have to give him credit in these moments. We have to sing his praises. If you're unsure, why wouldn't you just assign the credit to God anyway? If we prayed for it, and half the time, this is what we do, right? We pray for it, and then it doesn't show up in the next week, and we forget we prayed for it, and we even asked other people to pray for it, and then nine months go by, and now all of a sudden there's a blessing. Four years go by, and all of a sudden there's a blessing. You realize, I was just talking with somebody else about this a few minutes ago, Pastor Jeff and Tanya, they had a vision and and a plan and and an understanding that they knew they were called to go to the Philippines 13 years ago. It took 13 years for that to come to fruition. But they don't somehow discount that, oh, God wasn't working in that time. God was lining up all the things for that to happen. And now they didn't just go, they've been sent. And they're being well received on on that other side. So when it comes to to sharing or modeling, right, I want to encourage you to inspire, encourage, glorify God in how we do this. That's what we're called to do. So just a minute here, I'm going to play, we're going to play a couple of testimony videos we've recorded over the last few weeks and months, and we'll kind of talk about it a little bit. But I want you to know if you've got a testimony, if you've witnessed something, this this stories at rockfishchurch.com. You can send an email and say, look, I've, I've got something that I just didn't have a mechanism to share with before. I want to share it with a bigger audience. I want to make it available for the world to hear about what God did, whether in a moment, a season, in a lifetime. And I want to share that. And we've got the vehicle for it. You can, all you got to do is email this address right here. Or you, you can even connect with anybody on staff that you see back in the tech booth or or one of the volunteers here, like John, and we're going to connect you with the right people. All right, but we got to remember, we are ambassadors. That means we don't just hold a position, we have to carry a message. And this is just an opportunity to share that message. He gave us, each one of us right now, if we claim Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have a testimony, we have a story that took us from a broken, dead person with no hope to somebody living a new life. And it's our responsibility as ambassadors to share that message for the next person who needs to hear it. So let's go ahead and uh, queue up Felicia's story. Are we good? Perfect. Hi, I'm Felicia, and this is my testimony 
of how even though when we feel the most forgotten, God remembers us. Three years ago, I faced one of the hardest days of my life. My husband and I were expecting to adopt a baby boy. It was the boy that we have prayed for, and I'd always felt like God told me we would have a son, so that's, that's what we were praying for. So I remember the day that he was born, like it was yesterday, and that's kind of unfortunate, because even though I was there to watch him come into this world, I cut his umbilical cord, I cared for him for the first 24 hours of his sweet little life, I left the hospital without him. It kind of has a happy ending, I guess. He is alive. He didn't succumb to the plans that the enemy had for him, which was to take his life before he ever breathed his first breath. So that is a wonderful testimony in itself. But our hearts were broken. About four months later, we get a phone call and there is another baby, and it is another baby boy. And so my heart gets excited because I know we're supposed to have a baby boy. Well, the family learns all about us. They learn that we go to church, that we have stable jobs, that we you know, live on property, and we have other children, and all the good things. And then they see our picture, and they find out that we're an interracial family. And automatically, something that we have no control over disqualified us as parents in their eyes. I couldn't fix that. To not even be seen as a good mom, to, to look at our daughter and see, wow, she is in excellent health and know she's loved. After that crushing moment, I gave up. So I thought, this is it. And I'm okay with that because we're happy and we have our family. Then one day, my husband, who was perfectly happy with no more children, he begins to pray before we eat. And he says, Lord, please give her the desires of her heart. I um, look up at him when he's done and say, hey bro, you, you understand what that means, right? Because he knew how badly I wanted that baby boy and how deeply I felt like God had told me that we would have a son. And he said, yes. Now, if you rewind three weeks, um, I finally got rid of every baby thing that was in our house. I thought we were done. But God, he remembered me. He gave me the most beautiful dream. And in that dream, I held my son. I could see him in the womb. And as I'm looking at him, that melted away and I saw his sweet face and all of his little features. And I woke up and I said, Lord, if that's you, you you've got to tell me because this, this was different. And so I prayed that prayer several times during the night. And the next morning I said, look, God, I am not the smartest person in the world. You're going to have to give me a sign that I cannot ignore. And fast forward a couple hours and my phone goes off. And it is someone that I have not spoken to at this point in about a year. It was the mom of the baby that we walked away from. And she said, hey, are y'all still interested in adopting? And I said, absolutely. And just hours after me asking the Lord for a sign I couldn't ignore, my phone begins to blow up with ultrasound pictures of a baby boy. Now, fast forward a few months and I'm beginning to gather things again. So we get ready and we go and we see his ultrasound in his sweet little face. And I tell his birth mom, I know exactly what this baby's gonna look like. And she said, what? And I said, he is going to have this beautiful mocha latte colored skin and a head full of really curly hair. And she just looked at me and said, uh-huh, because none of her other babies had curly hair. If they had any hair at all, it wasn't curly. And I said, yeah, that's it. And the day my son was born, when I laid eyes on him, he was the exact baby from my dream. And in that moment, all I could do was laugh 
and cry because I knew for a fact that God had put that into me so that I would know not to fear this entire process. And so when she sees the baby, she remembers that I told her what he would look like. And she looks at me and she's in amazement. And oddly enough, he looks just like me. So what's the point of me telling you this whole story? It's that no matter what you're facing, God remembers you. He remembered me and he provided the exact desires of my heart. How about that testimony? Right? And we and here's the thing, that's just a, that's just a small portion of Felicia's testimony of her of her story of God working in her life. It's just one little moment, one season that she went through. I mean, truth be told, there's there's way more a way, way, way more additional, powerful testimony within that family alone. It was like every child they have is adopted, and how that came to be, and some of it actually the 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 first one they adopted came through sharing of the gospel in a church service, because their their first daughter was destined, or at that time it was already planned the child was going to be aborted. But that family that had that plan happened to be sitting in church one particular weekend where Pastor Tony happened to be speaking about a whole bunch of things. And within that sermon, uh, brought into context abortion and, and what that meant. And that, that there could be other choices and options. And so that family came to him afterwards and spoke to him and said, this is the situation. This is the plan. Can you connect us with somebody who can help us? And now that, that baby girl is, is, like she said, alive and healthy and well, and she's probably better at sharing the gospel than half of us in this, in this room based on the stories and the act, actions I see on a regular basis with her. But if, as Felicia said, right, God, God remembered her. And we don't say remembered in the sense of like, oh, he forgot. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, oh, Felicia totally forgot, totally forgot, right? No, he said he doesn't forget. That, that's the remembering that occurs. That He hears the prayers of our heart. He knows the desires of our heart, what we pray for, what we need, and what we truly desire. And He answers them in His way and in His time, but we have to trust Him. We've all got these little stories. And for us, it's, it's minuscule. I want to encourage you. Be willing Search your heart. What is it you're grateful for? What did God do? What is the little thing and the big thing that you want to share with this world? Can we cue up Sam's story? Good? All right. So generally, this time of year, normally I get into a reflective mode. And what that is, is I kind of look back over the events or things that have happened throughout the year and kind of reflect on them. This year, God's taken me to a different level to look back on things all the way back to my childhood and uh, the storms that I've went through and the storms that me and my, my wife Samantha have gone through, uh, just proving the fact that no matter how the, the low, the dark, the valley gets and whatever giant stands in your way, he's been there. He's fulfilled the promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. and. In that, he's not looked like I thought it should, and his provision has not looked like I thought it should, but it's been there, and I can't dispute that. And, but looking back at that, it has taught me that if it wasn't for those storms and those trials, I wouldn't be the man I am today. And we wouldn't, Samantha and I wouldn't have the marriage we have today. And for that, I'm grateful and thankful because not that I'm arrived, but that my faith is stronger through those storms and my walk is stronger because of those storms. And that I'm, not that I'm done, not that there won't be more, but I know he's got me, I know he's with me, and I know he'll provide for me or for us during that time.
Even these, even these little things, right, that we, we don't expect it to look this way, as Sam said, right? He expected it to, to look and feel different. And yet he couldn't deny that it was God's hand moving in these situations that got him there. And he, he said, and what he said there is, he said, my, my wife and I wouldn't have the same relationship that we have right now because they, you end up going through something usually together with somebody else. You may not be in unity through the entire process, right? But you end up, typically, the things we're going through are, are relational or they're family-related, whatever it may be. And so I, I'm actually going through something myself right now. I'm, I'm watching some other people in my family suffer in ways that, that I, I can't really do a whole lot about. I can't fix it for them. But it's hurting me and my wife to watch it go on. And it's actually brought us into a season where we're probably closer and more in alignment and appreciative of each other and each other's pain or distress through this whole situation than we've ever been. We're going on 18 years of marriage, and, and the last three, four months seems like a whole new season in our life. But it, every time I look back, I'm saying it, it's probably tied to what we're watching happen to other people in the family. So we need to look for God and His hand moving in all these situations in, in ways we haven't expected before, ways we didn't anticipate or plan for. Because if, if it always turned out the way we planned or expected, we'd probably just take credit ourselves, right? So God's got to do something a little different sometimes to get our attention and, and, and to get us to put our eyes on Him and to realize, you know, it, it has been Him this whole time. And even though we had an idea of what beautiful and perfect and whole looked like, He's able to change it. Who would have thought that saving man from their deprived state, depraved state, would be to send his son to die on the cross for us in our place. Who, who would have pictured that before it happened? And so many see it and hear about it, and yet they, they can't accept it because we're too busy concerning ourselves with what we think ought to take place. So the hard unspoken truth of Christianity, Christianity is that the best thing is that when, when God is doing something great, it's almost always going to come in some kind of painful or uncomfortable package for us to have to deal with. But it's through our pain that we seek Him. We, we get low and we worship. We get on our knees. We, we put our face to the ground and, and we cry out. Whatever that looks like for you, it's not that it has to be dramatic is that we realize that there is no other solution. There is no other Savior for that situation, no healer for that ailment than Him. But it's through these tests and through these trials that, that our faith is revealed. It's, it's tested, right? So what, what's the, the common thing to say is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? I, I wholeheartedly disagree most of the time, if something didn't kill you, you're probably a little bit weaker and more beat up because of it. But your resolve, your resilience, your ability to see, realize, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was, and here I am on the other side. I'm not necessarily stronger, but my faith could be stronger. My faith is better tested, and now I see, even in the moments of pain and despair, that that that's when I need God most, and, and I'd probably have better access to Him if I was seeking Him on a regular basis on the good days. In the time of famine, it's not really a time of famine at all if you've been living according to the ways of saving up and squirreling away blessings as they are poured on you in the good seasons. So look at Hebrews 11. Everybody familiar with Hebrews 11? The the hall of faith, right? Where we recognize the, these people that, that moved in faith and committed to things. If you're not familiar with Hebrews 11, I'd encourage you to look it up. Like These are the people that their, their name shows up again in the New Testament as being honored and, and noticed and, and revered as people who moved in faith in the Old Testament. And yet some of them never saw the fruit. Abraham never saw the fruit of God's promise. It was for generations to come. Well, let me rephrase. He never saw it in this life. He's going to see it. And that's where we, another thing we need to hold on to, right, is the realization that 
what we do while we're in this living, breathing body. That's not all that we're going to do, all we're going to experience, and all the victory we're going to celebrate. We're going to continue to, to worship and honor him when we get to heaven. So I'd ask you to consider, what, what are these things? What's been on your heart since the beginning or the end of our worship session where we prayed about the things we're grateful for and what else has been revealed and what else is going to be revealed in this month as we go through these services. The goal is not to pluck on heartstrings and make us feel something, like to draw something out. It make us to realize that there are things we're already grateful for and we just need to give Him credit and we need to share that testimony with others. We need to share that story of victory of God's moving in our life for somebody else to receive the same hope that we now have. So I would encourage you again, share your story. If you're nervous about sharing your story, practice sharing your story. But everyone's got a story. And it may be the most powerful weapon you have in breaking somebody else free from their change and being a part of that. It may be the tool that gives you the the ability to sit with somebody else while they're going through a season that that you can relate and you can just say, it's going to be over soon. And you're not in it alone. I'm sitting here right here with you. And I'm going to be with you on the other side. We can't overlook these things, guys. They're powerful. They're, They're intentional. They're given to us for a reason that we would go and share. And they should inspire us because we've received love that we should give love and that we've received good works that we would go and do good works. That's it for today, guys. Pretty pretty short sermon. We're going to have more videos this month, like I said, of, of testimonies. If you want to share your testimony, I would encourage you reach out to the office or, or email stories at rockfishchurch.com. I don't care how you get in contact with us. Let us help you share your story and refine that ability. We should have hundreds of people willing to share their story. And if it's not, is it, is it because we just don't have the time? We're not willing to make the time? Or we're not sure where we can give God credit or, or where we should take credit? I, I don't know. A lot of times I think we're, we're reticent to, to share stories of his victory in our life because we think we sound a little crazy or a little kooky and we start saying well God did this and God told me that if we are not willing to acknowledge him before one person sharing that story of his greatness in our life I don't really see how that's much different than denying him completely if we're going to give him credit we got to give him credit for everything so again be encouraged if you if you would uh, join me and stand. We'll, we'll pray. We'll get out of here. We'll go pick up these kids before we start the Rockfish Church uh, sweatshop. Father God, we 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 are thankful. We are grateful for all you've done, Lord. I know there's more that you need to reveal to us in the coming weeks, in the coming days, maybe on the way home, Lord. Something's going to hit us. I pray that you would give us the the fortitude, the strength the courage to share our story, the the, the means we have to be vulnerable, Lord, I pray that you would give us that courage. Whether we share it in a video form or we share it online or we share it with a brother or sister, one at a time, Lord, whatever that is, I pray that you would encourage us to do it and that you would help us have the discipline to model what it is to love, to model what it is to do good works for nothing other than glorifying you and how you modeled good works and love your time here on this planet and in your humanly body, Lord. I pray that we would be strengthened and encouraged by you all week long. That we would rejoice and we would praise you just a little bit more than we've been doing in the past few weeks, Lord. I pray that you would bless every brother and sister in here. That they would be surrounded and filled with your love, with your Holy Spirit, your encouragement, and your comfort, Lord. Please let us go in peace and come back and see each other again next Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.